We have a love-hate relationship with work. Actually, let me rephrase that. We love to hate it. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you talk to or where you go, the story is always the same, and you've probably told it yourself. Work sucks, and there's somebody somewhere out there called the boss who seems to be keeping people down. In fact, last year, there was a study about it. At the center of that study was a survey of CEOs, and it found that 20% of the CEOs that were surveyed had dramatically high levels of psychopathic traits. I would just like to say, because of the work that I do, I've not met any of these people. <laughs> but it is about the same rate as in the prison population in the US. Now, psychopaths aside, our state of work is not myth. In Hong Kong, we have the longest working hours of 71 cities globally. And this year, we have a very dubious honor of being called a city of sadness. We've ranked number 76 on the UN World Happiness Report, and that puts us right below Pakistan. Now, it's making us depressed, stressed, and unhappy. And when it's really bad, it's killing us, literally. Now, you'd think that with all of this productivity that we're unleashing, with all the hours that we're working, that companies would be immensely successful. Well, it turns out that only 12% of the Fortune 500 companies that are on the list today were on that list in 1955. And I would hazard a guess that 60 years from today, they won't be on that list and they may not even be around. Companies are struggling. So why isn't work what it should be for us? And when we have those conversations with our family and our friends, and even ourselves, we talk about how we're not being acknowledged at work for the effort that we put in, or that it lacks meaning, or that it doesn't have purpose for us. And an incredible thing happens as a result of those conversations. Every morning, we get up, we have a bite to eat, we get dressed, and sometime before we leave for the office, we leave a big part of ourselves behind. It's mostly unconscious. But that part of you that's unique and personal and intimate and special and extraordinary gets left at home. Instead, a really good version of you, the walking, talking, professional kind, heads into the office. Think of it as your avatar, or as my kids like to say, your bitmoji. This is not a behavior that's to a certain group of people. We all exhibit it and we all behave that way, regardless of culture and regardless of country. In 2015, Gallup did a major research study and it found that only 13% of people in the workforce today were emotionally invested and engaged in their job. That left a whopping 87% who are not disinterested, disengaged, and not bringing themselves to work. Now, when you take that 87%, and you put that across the entire working population globally, that gives you a disengaged population of 2.6 billion people currently on this planet. Now, the best companies out there got to an average of 64%. And compared to 13%, you'd think that's pretty good in terms of the number of people that were coming to the office. But let me give you an example of what a 10-person best-in-class company looks like. That means that six people every day are gonna come into the office and they're gonna have a hell yeah, I'm here, let's do this kind of an attitude. And four people are gonna be at best, meh, or I don't think so. Now if you take that out to 10,000 people, that has 4,000 disengaged employees who are coming to work as avatars every day. And the cost of not showing up at work annually, just in the US alone, is half a trillion dollars a year. Now in my own work, I've led teams from all over the world in companies, large and small. And I have been obsessed with this question of what it means to bring ourselves to work and what can we do about it. I've seen people on my own team fly below the radar. Good people, uncommitted, quiet in meetings only to see what's important to them in their life and what makes them extraordinary 
show up on my Facebook feed at night. So I started asking myself questions like, what goes into unleashing the potential of a person at work? And what would it feel like to go into work where everybody was like that around you and to work with a team like that? And could that team be impactful, purposeful, and profitable all at the same time? Around the time that I was asking myself those questions, I too heard from my dad. He's in the habit of writing long emails on life to his children, espousing and sharing his wisdom, which he's collected over almost 80 years of his life now. And in this particular one, he talked to me about what he thought went into the responsibilities of a leader. And he said, everyone has a life and a family that are important to them. And your job is to be responsible for each and every one of them on your team. And I knew this in my heart. But every day, the kinds of conversations I was involved in and discussions with other leaders were about, how do you make things more efficient? How do we make things productive or profitable? And nowhere in there were conversations about people and how would they find meaning. But when I had conversations with those leaders individually, and we talked about what kept them up at night or what made them happy, a real person emerged. So I've come to the conclusion over the years of asking this question of how do we bring our full selves to work, that the problem isn't people. The problem is that modern work is not fit for humans. Now, our current model of work is stuck in the past. In the 18th century, during the Industrial Revolution, we made a quantum leap of mechanizing operations. And in the process, we scaled human effort like never before. This was exactly the same time period where we coined the phrase human resources. And it means very specifically the count and the cost of human beings who oversee the machines. Now, when you add management into that, you now have a layer of people who are overseeing a layer of people who are overseeing the machines. And that kind of complexity made companies put in administration, organizational structures, processes, systems, policies, all to make things work smoothly. And I would say that if we were still in the 18th century, that would be a bang up winning strategy for success. But we're not. We're in a time period where work is being disrupted across every single industry that we know, and it's disrupting us in the process. But what if work was different? What if you turned on human emotion at work? What would that feel like? People would come alive. They would share, they would care, they would innovate, they would collaborate, they would make things for others, and in all of that, we would thrive. And imagine if human feeling was in abundance at work, and you designed everything about work to make work awesome. Instead of human resources teams, you'd create happiness teams, and they would be dedicated to the well-being of everybody on that team all the time. We would share with each other, we would care about one another, and it would be infectious. It would scale to our customers and it would make our companies thrive. Imagine if you were on such a team, and imagine the leader that you would have as part of that team. A leader who would build trust with you, faith. You would follow them, and you would know that they were creating a space for you, for your full self, to come to work every single day. And imagine the feeling of what it would like to report into those fine folks. Now, I'm not talking about a utopia here. There are amazing companies all over the world that are busting out of this old model, and they are creating new ones that are fit for human beings. Take Netflix, for example. They are infamous for a culture of openness with their people. They do away with formal policies on simple things even as vacation leave, because they believe if you hire fully formed adults, they'll know what to do, they'll be responsible about it, and they'll just get the job done. There's a great company in New York called NextJump. NextJump has two businesses. Business number one is a profit-making business where they have an e-commerce platform, and they're famous for having a no-firing policy. Business number two, is their not-for-profit leadership academy. They share everything about the success of their company with leaders from other companies. 
Everything from their culture to how they deliberately develop their people to how they mentor and how they coach is freely offered up. And they are scaling themselves and scaling other companies and they are in service of those companies. We're at a time where everything is changing at an exponential rate. And we're heading into a future that we can't quite predict. You don't have time to have avatars on your teams. You need 100% of 100% of your people to innovate and to be competitive and to make your future as a business. It's our responsibility in that future to lead with our humanity out front. So here's my ask of you. Tomorrow when you go to work, show up. Be the real you. Share with everybody who you know what makes you. And be specific about it. What are you good at? What motivates you? How do you work? Where do you draw courage from? What are your strengths and where might you need help? Think of it as your user manual on how to operate you. And then ask everybody on your team to do it as well and share what you learn with each other about one another. I will promise you it will change things and you will win together. And if after all of that and listening to me today, you're thinking to yourself that work is just really bad and every day it's friction and you're always hidden out of view, please go somewhere else new for you. You have one glorious, incredible life to live, and it doesn't come with a rewind button. You deserve to be someplace where you can be your full self every day and where people can honor you for exactly that. So just imagine what it would feel like to bring yourself to work every day. But more importantly, think about the very human world we'd be giving up on if we didn't. Thank you very much. Woo!